El Diablo does not agree with your immigration policy, Presidente. How can a true-blooded tropic can find a job and services when flocks of immigrants are constantly arriving on our island? This is the devil. Well, okay, El Diablo. And he's not really the devil. He's just some white guy living in the Caribbean who calls himself that. He's the spokesman of one of the political parties in the game Tropico 4, specifically the Nationalists. His primary role in the game is to make vigilante ethnic cleansing seem more whimsical. Welcome back for the long-awaited second installment of Graduated Gaming. At least I hope you've been awaiting it, and I know it's been a little while in coming, but it's here is the important part, right? So after all the grit and gloom of looking at Spec Ops The Line, I thought we'd go for something a little brighter and more chipper this time. Unfortunately, what I settled on was Tropico, which makes colorful as horrifying as, and maybe more horrifying than, gritty at least some of the time. That's my view, anyway. It takes a little more digging this time around to see what's really going on in these games. Uh, I'll be using the most recent Tropico game, Tropico 4, to talk about the whole series, minus the second pirate-themed one. Uh, basically, the first, third, and fourth Tropico games are just refinements of and expansions upon the same set of mechanics, settings, characters, and goals, so looking at the fourth one is really the best way to get the full picture. Uh, with Just understand that these games have been percolating a while in the minds of both the developers and myself. I don't feel bad excluding the second game either, because it failed to impress me in a pretty spectacular fashion. Tropico, then. For the uninitiated, the Tropico games are basically evil genius by way of SimCity, with a dash of black and white on top, and um, set in the mid-20th century Caribbean. In the likely event that that description wasn't too helpful, uh, here's the basic premise of the Tropico games. You play as the dictator of the small, impoverished Caribbean island nation of Tropico. Now, before I elaborate on that very basic setup, here's a few of the game's opening screens. Colorful and downright peppy, no? But what was up with those loading screens? Well. Let's head into the mission menu, which starts with character select and... Oh my great galloping giddy aunt Gertrude, that's... sobering. In case you don't recognize these names, or if you recognize some but don't understand my reaction, well, well that's what Wikipedia's for after all. So, yeah. This is a game that drenches you in color and festive music and lush scenery and then invites you to rule all of it as Papa Doc Duvalier, who is supposed to have murdered around 30,000 Haitians during his de decades of dictatorship. I usually play a custom dictator, which I'll discuss more uh, in more detail shortly. But the moral of the story for now is just that this isn't mere window dressing. There's no way to play this game as anything other than a dictator. Just like you can't play black and white as the Christian god, or as a con man pretending to be a god, or as a clockmaker god. Just as you can't play Starcraft as some random zergling, or a Terran civilian, or from the point of view of a Protoss drone. Uh, perhaps most relevantly, just as you can't play Spec Ops The Line as anyone other than Captain Walker, uh, you cannot play Tropico as anything other than a dictator. Here, though, it's a little different. You get to select or even create a character, uh, drawing player attention to the choice, to the role you're stepping into. Um, in my previous example, no such step exists. Uh, in Grand Theft Auto 4, for instance, you're Nico Bellic, period. Uh, you don't pick him out of a lineup. But here, you're not some StarCraft-esque anonymous eye in the sky. You're a particular, maybe even historical dictator, and you're being invited to step consciously into that role. Moreover, once you've selected or created your tyrant, uh, the gameplay as a whole continually reminds you of your role and reinforces your essential authoritarianism. There are basically two plausible ways to lose the game. Uh, go completely bankrupt or lose your grip on power, either through uh, losing an election or uh, having rebels destroy your palace. 
it doesn't matter how democratic or legitimate you try to make your government in-game while you're playing, you lose if you're ever voted out. Uh, on top of that, success in any one map might depend on several of any number of factors. Uh, number of a certain kind of building, uh, production of this or that resource, uh, overall happiness of tropical citizens, but success across the whole campaign is measured solely by the size of your personal Swiss bank account, um, which you primarily fill by embezzling and cutting secret deals with foreign powers, so yeah, there's that too. Uh, in fact, every facet of this game, from the basics I've described to the very wording of the yes and no choices you're occasionally given, and, and everything in between, helps to cast you as an unambiguously authoritarian political strong person. Uh, for all that you're an unusually powerful Caribbean dictator, uh, for example, you have the ability to control time and, and characters comment on it, it's, it's diegetic, it's something that you can do in the game, uh, not just as a utility of, of a computer game. Um, but anyway, you're, nevertheless, your role and your choices are strictly curtailed in most cases. Your role is one of immense, almost limitless power, but the game carefully controls the expressions of that power which are available to you. Uh, thereby ensuring that all of them reinforce the dictatorial position that the Tropico games put the player into. Now, none of this is exclusive to the selection of historical dictators, either. When you're creating your own dictator, uh, for example, you have to choose a rise to power. And even if you pick the, um, the Velvet Revolution option, where you uh, are elected by a popular, non-violent movement, uh, it comes with its own attendant advantages and disadvantages, even then, your continued control of Tropico represents a betrayal of that origin. Think about it. It's game over when you lose an election. Uh, uh, you can only afford to hold free elections when you're guaranteed to win. No matter how many years you reign by popular consent, your commitment to democratic principles is completely and fatally undermined by the necessity built into the game mechanics that you never, ever lose. Uh, the game itself makes even the sincere sincerest attempt to uphold government by consent completely provisional, uh, contingent, and therefore meaningless. Tropico can select its own ruler only so long as the ruler they select is you. That's not free elections. Uh, mechanically speaking, if you're voted out, the game ends. Uh, there is only one future, and that is where one where you're elected. If you're not elected, you load and, and either get elected or don't hold elections. So, they've built a deep cynicism into virtually all aspects of the game the developers have. There are four broad ways that you, the player-slash-dictator, interact with the world. Uh, you can build and manage structures, uh, you can respond when other characters or when the game itself offers you questions, prompts, demands, quests, that sort of thing. Um, you can issue policies and edicts. Uh, and you can issue orders regarding individual citizens, and they're basically in that order from most time spent to least time spent. Um, there are a few other things you can do in Tropico 4, but those four categories together make up easily 95% of the gameplay. So naturally, each of these interactions is designed to implicate you in all manner of unpleasantness, uh, but in the most, car most cartoonish ways possible. Most of your time in Tropico 4 is spent building structures and managing the ones you've already built. Even at the outset, the um, kind of odd idea that the apparently immortal political leader of the city would personally oversee each structure, though it's present in SimCity and games like it, but never really explained there, well, it's explained here. Uh, it's justified by Cold War era communism. Being a Castro analog, of course you, as the embodiment of the government, are in charge of the economy, down to the individual workers. Uh, it's actually the literalization of the phrase command economy. Uh, and you don't get a say in it. No matter how democratically or capitalistically you attempt to rule, the mechanics stay the same. Equally insidious are the management options themselves. Uh, for instance, the default production mode for most non-agricultural buildings in the game is sweatshop, uh, and you will very quickly find your economy floundering if you switch too many buildings over to the only other option labeled take it easy. You'll also spend a fair amount of time in Tropico just doing what people ask you to do, and gaining bonuses to approval from various domestic and foreign people and groups as a result. Maybe it's something relatively innocuous, uh, like the Soviets are asking you to export a certain amount of rum to them in exchange for increased financial support from their government. Um, even then, you can be sure that the request will come from Agent Sasha, 
uh, and ridiculously caricature propaganda speak. All of the characters in the game are absurd, uh, often offensive caricatures. America is represented by an extremely lazy Nixon parody uh, on the one hand, and an infuriatingly arrogant and insincere Texan senator on the other. Uh, there's an ambassador from the Middle East, as though it's one place, uh, who's an uncomfortably racist depiction of uh, an Arabian oil magnate, uh, possessed of a creepy obsession with camels. And there's uh, an anachronistic European Union in the game, which is represented by an aging, worn-out British fop. And these portrayals uh, are borne out in the mechanics as well, uh, in that the goods each foreign power wishes to trade in, and what will uh, please and displease them, all of that is very stereotypical as well. And things are no more nuanced in domestic politics either. Uh, remember El Diablo up at the top of the video? Uh, yeah, he's the head of the Nationalist Party in Tropico. The priest in charge of the religious faction is a drunkard. Uh, the teacher who leads the intellectual faction uh, is also a stripper who's into BDSM. Uh, the Loyalist Party uh, is headed up by your illiterate yes-man of a second-in-command, whose name is Penultimo. Uh, the list goes on, but the one thing all the characters in the game, domestic and foreign alike, have in common is that they embody an incongruously light-hearted version of the very worst aspects of the group they represent. No group, no matter how seemingly well-intentioned in real life, is credible or sympathetic in the world of Tropico. Uh, which means that your in-game relationship to them is necessarily reduced to simply trying to gain an advantage. Take green policies, for instance. Um, they have no value or benefit in the game other than improving your economy and keeping your populace under control. Uh, you need natural beauty to attract tourists. Uh, you know, if you have a lot of environmentalists in your population, you'll want to keep them happy. There's no intrinsic value to keeping the, the island nice. Uh, and it's not possible to buddy up to Sunny Flowers, the, the leader of the Green uh, Environmentalist Party, either. Uh, even if you do everything she asks, the best outcome is that you're hearing from her opponents instead of her, uh, as they're going to be dissatisfied now that she's happy. Um, so you better make sure that doing what she says is in your best interest anyway. These are the people who are making the requests of you, and, and very rarely will these tasks and quests be so benign as my Soviet example a few minutes ago. Domestic political parties in particular will very frequently request something deleterious to your economy, uh, and which is sure to upset the other factions on top of that, um, something that works to their benefit and no one else's. Uh, they're all ideologically motivated. Um, and, and at loggerheads with one another. Uh, playing as a pragmatist is essentially the only way to get ahead. But answering discrete requests from interest groups is only one way to make larger scale decisions about your small nation. There are also a wide variety of edicts that you can issue, uh, from founding a secret police system to legalizing gay marriage. Lots of things in between as well. If you've never played the game before, you might well think that this, finally, must be where you can take a stand. Uh, sure, you might be enacting these edicts uh, unilaterally as a despot, but, but still, this must be where you can decide what kind of despot you're going to be, right? Well, as you've probably already guessed, no. Take legalizing same-sex marriage, for instance. It seems like you're taking a moral stand on a matter by either enacting or not enacting the edict, but the game doesn't treat it that way. All it really does in terms of game mechanics is to make the intellectual faction happier while displeasing the religious faction. Uh, the game itself does not acknowledge any dimension to, to this kind of decision beyond political pragmatism. Uh, who will like the decision and who will not? Regardless of an individual player's views of right and wrong, and, and all other in-game considerations being equal, it will always be worse for your success at the game to enact same-sex marriage if the number of people in the religious faction is greater than the number of people in the intellectual faction, full stop. Uh, the reverse is also true. If you have more intellectuals in your island than you have religious faction, then it will always be better to enact same-sex marriage, all other things being equal. All of that just leaves uh, the least frequently used of the four main methods of affecting the game world. Orders concerning individual citizens. At the outset of most maps, you will usually have a population on your tropical island uh, of maybe 50 people. Most of the time, the number of uh, souls in your care will rise to between maybe 300 and 600 in the course of a mission, the very few maps eventually seeing total populations of 1,000 or so. 
through any number of lists and filters by looking through housing or by simply just zooming in and, and looking around the map, you can select any citizen of Tropico and see extremely detailed information about them. Their age, sex, nationality, family tree, job, residence, party affiliation, favorite issues, current activities, satisfaction with various aspects of life on the island, and even recent thoughts. So, simply by placing the player in the role of a dictator and then giving them access to this information is kind of has a very dystopian police state feel to it to begin with, but provided you've got the cash, the facilities, and for some actions the uh, correct edicts active, you can go further, uh, imprisoning, executing, or even disappearing your citizens. If that last, in particular, doesn't send a shiver down your spine, I encourage you to do some reading on the topic of authoritarian regimes in Latin America, um, or pick up A Hundred Years of Solitude by uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. Um, I don't have time to go into it right now, but uh, it's not something developers made up. Um, as before, though, the game offers no commend the citizen for their hard work button, but instead just informs you that in addition to a cash cost associated with executing a citizen, I think it's a thousand dollars, uh, it is likely to make their family dislike your regime if you kill them. And naturally, all of this is wrapped up in bright colors, peppy Latin music, mildly racist caricatures, and facepalm-worthy jokes. In stark contrast to something like Spec Ops The Line, Tropico really does seem to think this is all pretty funny. It's not a condemnation of totalitarian regimes, their role in global politics, their effect on their citizens, uh, or anything else in particular, really. Uh, one could interpret the game as a fairly scathing critique of the very concept of government, but when I play the game, it doesn't really seem like it has strong enough feelings to be polemical. It doesn't even seem to care whether or not it causes you to think about what you're doing in-game, uh, beyond problem-solving. Instead, the Tropico series consists of games which use the comically inconsequential scale of a 50-person Caribbean island nation against the backdrop of a Cold War to highlight all the gross absurdities of government and politics in general. And then they double over laughing at anyone who thinks any government, anywhere ever, has ever been better than this. It's by cannily limiting player choices and actions rather than expanding them that Tropico manages, with little to no plot to speak of, to so successfully and insidiously install the player into the role of an authoritarian dictator. It then uses that perspective to paint a deeply cynical, pessimistic picture of the nature of political power. But instead of reacting to that picture with angst or anger or melancholy, Tropico instead seems to view it as giddy entertainment. Uh, and invites us to laugh alongside it. What else are you going to do, it seems to ask. Change things? <laughs> Good luck with that. And don't say we didn't warn you.